Tamla Horsford was last seen alive at an overnight house party that she attended on the evening of November 3rd, 2018. The event was a birthday party for the homeowner, John Myers, who Tamla knew because their sons played on the same football team. The next morning, Tamla was found unresponsive in the backyard and appeared to have fallen from the home's deck, which was about 15 feet off the ground. The following February, investigators announced Horsford's death had been ruled accidental. The Forsyth County Sheriff's Office closed the investigation, finding no evidence of foul play. To this day, though, Tamla's loved ones believe that there is more to the story, and what really happened that night remains a mystery. I'm Ashton, and welcome to The Haunted Corner. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Haunted Corner. Today's episode topic is a case that has frustrated me for a while. The case is the mysterious death of Tamla Horsford. And there's just a lot that goes into this case. There's a lot that was handled improperly. There was a lot of misinformation given by the people that were there that night. And it's just a mess. So let's get into it. Tamla Horsford was born in 1978 in the Caribbean. In 1989, her family moved to the Bronx, and she eventually moved to Florida when she met her husband, Leander. She was a mother of five boys between the ages of four and 14, and she also had a stepdaughter who was Lee's daughter from a previous relationship. But Tamla had come into the picture when the daughter was pretty young, so Tamla raised her as her own from the beginning. Tamla was also known as Tam, and she had been married to her husband, Leander, for over 16 years at the time of her death. Tamla and Lee were preparing to become grandparents as their daughter was expecting her first child. The family had moved from Florida to Cumming, Georgia for Lee's job, and they ended up moving to an area where football is really big, and her sons played football, so that worked out really well for the family. The county that they moved to, however, was a known racist county. We talked about Forsyth County in last week's episode about Lake Lanier and the dark history surrounding it. In 1912, almost every one of the town's more than 1,000 black residents were driven out, and Forsyth County has gone through a lot since then. The racism has continued throughout the years, and in 1987, there was a march held to bring awareness to the racism in the and injustice that was abound, but they were met with angry members of the community who, quote, wanted to keep the county pure, end quote. The sheriff at the time of Horsford's death, Ron Freeman, has himself faced allegations of racism and nepotism, and to this day, Forsyth County remains dominated by the white majority, with only 4% of the population representing people of color as of 2020. The people in Tamla's life would describe her as selfless, giving, loving, and strong. She was very open to anyone she would meet. She was a natural caregiver, and she was looking forward to becoming a grandmother. Her husband, Lee, Tamla's husband, Lee, would describe her as, quote, having the biggest heart on the planet, end quote. Tamla's best friend, Michelle Graves, has continued to fight for justice for Tamla. Tamla and Michelle met when the family moved to Cumming, and they had been friends for approximately five years at the time of her death. Like most moms, Tamla's children were her world. She loved being a mom, and she dedicated her life to being around her kids, and she was just a great mom from what I read. On the night of November 3rd, Tamla arrived late to the house party because she had been making dinner for her husband and her kids before getting them set up for the night. She even made them breakfast, like a casserole for breakfast for the next morning, so they would have everything that they needed while she was gone. She arrived at the home of Jean Myers around 8.30 p.m. 
She had only known Jean for a few months, so they weren't super close at the time, and they only really knew each other from football. Tamla had only been to Jean's home one time before that night, which was the weekend prior, when she and her children had gone over to carve pumpkins. The night of the third was supposed to be a fun and safe way for the adults to spend time together and celebrate Jean's birthday. They were planning on enjoying drinks, games, and the LSU versus Alabama football game was on that night, so they were going to watch that as well. And the sleepover part of the party was just to keep everyone from drinking and driving. It was just to keep them safe, they said. Tamla had initially told her husband, Lee, that she didn't really want to go to the party, but she didn't want to be rude by not going, so she decided to attend. The party was planned by Jean's friend, Stacy Smith, and the party guests included Jean, Stacy, Tamla, Madeline, Nicole, Marcy, Bridget, Jennifer, Sarah, and Paula. Tamla was the only black woman in attendance, and not everyone knew each other. Initially, it was supposed to be a women's only party. However, there were two men that were there as well. One of the men in attendance was Jose Barrera, who was the 27-year-old boyfriend of Jean, and the other was Tom Smith, who was Stacy's husband. Now, even though they weren't supposed to be at the party, Jose claimed that he wasn't feeling good and there was something going on at Tom and Stacy's house, which Tom didn't want to be there for, so he decided to stay as well. Jose and Tom claimed that they were going to stay out of the way and they would stay in the basement, which they did, aside from when they all ate gumbo together and decided to watch the end of the football game. Some of the women had their husbands drop them off at the party, but others, including Tamla, drove themselves to the party. Tamla arrived at the party, took off her boots, and changed into her pajamas, which had paw prints on them. Tamla brought a bottle of tequila as a birthday gift for Jean, but the gift was not really well received. Jean made it pretty clear to Tamla that she wasn't going to drink the tequila because she didn't like tequila, so Tamla ended up drinking it throughout the night. Now, throughout the night, everyone was having a good time. There's pictures and videos of them just looking like they were having a great time. Tamla was the only one who smoked at the party. However, later in the evening, Madeline, who's Jean's aunt and actually lived with Jean at the time, decided to smoke a little bit of weed with Tamla, allegedly, and Stacy claimed that she had a couple puffs as well. The fun quickly ended, though, when Jean came outside and kind of got upset, telling them to stop because Jose was there. Well, why would it matter if Jose was there, you might ask? Well, he worked as a pretrial probation officer in Forsyth County at the time, and that will come back later. The last person to arrive at the party around 10 o'clock p.m. was Paula. Around that time, Sarah and Nicole were getting ready to leave because they had some child care issues, I guess. Now, after the LSU versus Alabama game had ended, the party guests decided to play Cards Against Humanity, and video shows them having a good time playing the game, and Tamla actually FaceTimed her husband, Leander, and the kids during that time, and she just wanted to show them off to everybody at the party, and her husband said that it looked like they were having a good time at that point. The first people to head to bed were... Marcy and Jennifer. They headed to bed around 1245 and they watched Shrek before passing out, which is like, yeah, same. I would have done that too. I love Shrek. Um, around one o'clock to 115, everyone else was kind of talking about where they were going to be sleeping. Tamla had wanted to go home at that time, apparently, but she was prevented from leaving by Jean, Stacy, and Tom. Now, eventually she agreed that she would stay but it does make you wonder just how differently things would have turned out if she had been allowed to leave like she had wanted to, or at least call her husband to come get her. Now, Jean and Jose said goodnight to the other guests and went upstairs, and they were followed by Stacy and Tom, so everybody was heading to bed. And at that point, Tamla and Bridget were the only ones who were awake. Jose says he saw Tamla in the kitchen when he went downstairs to get his phone charger from the basement but he claims that he only saw her and not Bridget. But from that angle, he couldn't see anyone with Tamla because of the way the stairs came down and it kind of blocked the view. So, but Bridget said that she was awake at that time because she was waiting for her husband to come get her. 
while Tamla ate a bowl of gumbo. Now, when Bridget's husband, Gary, arrived to pick her up, she said that Tamla walked her to the door and kissed her on the cheek and said goodbye. But later on, Gary would go on to say that when he picked up his wife, he couldn't see anyone else with her at the door. So a little bit of confusing information there. Now, Jean's house had a security system that kept track of the doors when they open and close, and it also sent a timestamp notification to Jean's phone when any of the doors were opened or closed. So here's where we get a little bit more into the timeline. There is a timestamp of the front door being opened and closed at 1.47 a.m., and that's when it's speculated that Bridget was picked up by her husband. That's what she says. At 1.49 a.m., the back door opens, and then at 1.50 a.m., it closes. And this is when it's suspected that Tamla went out on the patio to smoke another cigarette before heading to bed. That was her plan. She was just going to go smoke another cigarette and head to bed at that point after Bridget had left. Now, at 1.57 a.m., the back door opens again and never closes. At 4.10 a.m., the front door opens, and then it, this is when one of the women, Marcy, left to go to work. She had started a new job recently, and this would be her second day. Now, apparently some sources mentioned that she didn't have to work until 10.30 a.m., so some people kind of thought of it as odd that she would leave so early. Around 7.30 a.m., Paula left, and around 8 to 8.30 a.m., Stacy and Tom went home as well. The next person to wake up is Jean's aunt, Madeline. She woke up between 8 and 8.30 a.m. and eventually made her way to the kitchen to make some coffee. While she was making her coffee, she looked out the window and noticed something in the grass in the backyard. She quickly realized that it was Tamla laying in the grass in the backyard, not moving, and rather than going out to check on her or calling 911 or getting help for Tamla, she gets on her knees and she starts praying. Now, according to the interview with Madeline, she couldn't remember Tamla's name, but she remembered her pajamas with the paw prints on them. So why was her first instinct to start praying? When she finally finishes with her prayers, having still not called 911 or checked on Tamla at all, Madeline goes upstairs to Jean's room. When she gets to the door, she can hear water running. So she doesn't knock on the door. She decides to go back downstairs. She looks at Tamla one more time, and then she goes quickly back upstairs, knocks on the door, and when they answer the door, she says, I need Jose to come downstairs immediately. And when they ask why, she says, quote, your friend from the islands is laying in the backyard and she's not moving, end quote. Your friend from the islands? Really? Now, according to Jose's interview, he and Jean were asleep at the time that Madeline came to the door. So it couldn't have been water running that she had heard coming from their room, but maybe it was from somewhere else in the house. Now, Jose and Jean immediately put on their clothes and headed downstairs while Jean called 911 at 8.59 a.m. Now, I'll put the 911 call link in the show notes and in the post for, on the blog for today's episode. In the 911 call, you can hear Jean asking for an ambulance and for police to get sent to her house. She describes the party, and she says that while most of the partygoers had gone to bed, one had stayed up and she was drinking, and now she was laying face down in the backyard. She says, quote, I think maybe she fell off the balcony, end quote. When the 911 operator asks if Tamla is breathing, Jean replies that she doesn't know, she's face down. At that point, Jean gives the phone to Jose, who comes onto the phone and describes that Tamla is in the backyard. She's not breathing. She's face down. He also mentioned that he hadn't tried to turn her over or render aid in any way, which is like, hello. And that at that point, the operator has to tell him to check if she's breathing. Like, no one is even checking to see if she's breathing. No one is rendering aid in any way. <sighs> So Jose then goes on to describe how far she would have fallen, and it would be noted that the official height from the patio to the ground is almost 15 feet. Police were dispatched and arrived at the scene at 9.07 a.m. The Forsyth County Major Crimes Unit and a crime scene investigator arrived on scene as well as an investigator from Forsyth County Coroner's Office. 
one thing that has been highly talked about is the way people have described Tamla's body when they saw it, as opposed to when, to the way the police claim that she was positioned when they arrived. In the 911 call, Jose says she's face down and her head is not turned to either side. So she's just, it's like she face planted into the grass. She's not looking either way and her arms are by her side with her palms facing up. Now, why wouldn't she brace herself if she tripped or fell off the patio? It didn't appear that she had tried to brace herself in any way. Now, when the police arrived, however, they had said that her left arm was bent at the elbow and extended away from her body. So did someone move her body? The only person who is documented in the initial investigation to have touched her body is the homeowner's boyfriend, Jose. He declared her dead after touching or lifting her leg, depending on which report you read. Two years later, one of the deputies remembered something from that day, and he had a possible theory of what had happened. In his initial report, he wrote, quote, I saw what appeared to be a dece deceased female, so I went inside and started questioning people. He gave no indication he touched or interacted with Horsford's body. But when the GBI kept asking question about, questions about Horsford's arm, he stated he did take her pulse and in the process may have moved her arm. It was reported that her body was found almost underneath the balcony. Deputies were even confused by what had happened. Initially, Jean was so convinced that Horsford didn't fall from the top floor balcony that she went on social media and said such. Like, she was just convinced that that's not what had happened. The lead detective, Michael Christian, agreed with her and told the medical examiner, quote, the position of the body does not appear that she had fallen directly from the balcony, rather ground level, end quote. From the start, Horsford's family and friends expressed concerns about how authorities handled the investigation. The family believes that the scene was never treated like a crime scene despite the yellow tape that had been put up around the house. Forsyth County deputies repeatedly told them that it would all make sense when they ha once they had access to their reports. Michelle Graves, Tamla's friend, though, still wants to know why no one had tried to roll Horsford over to render CPR after discovering her outside. Not even the police who called off EMS, according to documents provided as part of the investigation. On the body camera audio, you can hear one of the deputies walking another deputy through the different people at the scene. He mentions Jose Barrera, quote, we've got some mutual friends together. I've known Jose for a while. We're friends, end quote. The deputy is heard saying that on video. Like, What? Initial observation of Tamla's body revealed that she had some visible injuries, including cuts on her face, arms, and legs. However, there was no blood found around her body. The investigation began, and the people who were present, including Jean, Jose, Madeline, and Jen, were brought inside the house for questioning, and it was requested at that time that Jean call everyone who was at the party that night back to the house for questioning. At that time, Tamla's body was taken to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy. During the autopsy, it was discovered that Tamla had multiple lacerations to her body, including a one-inch laceration to her wrist. Her wrist was also dislocated, a fourth of an inch laceration to her left forearm, and an eighth of an inch laceration to the tip of her index finger, as well as a half an inch abrasion to her lower left leg. She also had some smaller abrasions to her forehead, eyelid, nose, and chin. There was a three-fourth of an inch laceration to the right side of her heart, as well as severe injuries to her head, neck, and torso, including a fractured vertebrae. The toxicology report indicated traces of THC and Xanax in her system, as well as a blood alcohol level of 0.238. It should be known that Tamla did not have a prescription for Xanax, and it had not been metabolized by the liver yet at the time of the autopsy making it likely that she had taken the Xanax recently. The cause of death was listed as multiple blunt force injuries, and her manner of death was ruled accidental. The time of injury was listed as 1.30 a.m. However, this night was daylight savings time, so that could be the explanation for the time discrepancy. The GBI only took five photos in the autopsy, which was an unusually low number for a death investigation, according to experts. 
Leander was also notified of his wife's death in a very cold and callous way. According to an interview with Leander, when the police came to the door, they kept asking if he was Lee. When he responded and asked what it was pertaining to, they got increasingly hostile with him and eventually blurted out, quote, it's about your wife, she's deceased, end quote. The police then told him that she had tripped and fallen and they would not let him go over to the house. Not only did the police not actually know what had happened at that time because the autopsy hadn't been performed, this was just fresh off the scene of the accident, so-called, but the cause of death hadn't been determined, so this was just their version of events. They told him that everything had been taken care of and he didn't need to go over there. He was really confused as to how that had happened because he knows his wife. He knows that she can hold her liquor, according to him. Now, when he went to the funeral home, it was clear that they had put something on her face. He described it as looking like black shoe polish on her face. And when he confronted the funeral home about it, about it they apologized, but they claimed that they had to cover up the bruises on her face, which is just awful. Now, during the questioning of the party guests is when things get kind of weird. <laughs> While they were waiting for the party guests to return, Jean, Jose, Madeline, and Jen were left in the same room, which allowed them plenty of time to get their stories straight. They were allowed plenty of time to talk to each other and figure out what they were going to say, but everyone was kind of contradicting their own stories, and only some of the interviews were conducted that day, on the 4th, on the same day that Tamla's body was found but the rest of the interviews were completed between the 9th and the 20th of November. And they were not done at the police station. They were done at Jean's house because why wouldn't they, you know, like why wouldn't they? Jean's interview was kind of wild. She said that she bought the security system when she and her ex-husband had separated because he on occasion would come into the house when she wasn't home. So she bought cameras for protection. Now, she claimed that they were on better terms now, and she had forgotten about the batteries. The batteries had died, and she wasn't sure where the chargers were. You know, that's very shocking. I know we're all surprised by that. But Jean, during the interviews, she actually purchased Dunkin' Donuts gift cards for the investigators. So, and in the same interview, you can hear Madeline say that she was making cookies for the investigators. I'm not sure what angle we're going here for, ladies, but this is not looking, it's looking a little suspicious. <laughs> um, now, the investigators would go on to say that they couldn't accept the gift cards or the cookies. And Jean says, quote, do you need me or can I go get ready for this funeral? End quote. I just think it's gross, the <laughs> choice of words and the lack of compassion for the woman that had just died in her home and trying to give gift cards to the investigators. Like, what are you, Jean, what are you doing, girl? <laughs> now, Bridget's interview was something that raised a lot of questions as well. She went on a bunch of different tangents. She was talking about the kids and how she's always concerned about the children who weren't there that night. But, you know, if they were, she would have been really protective of them and looking out for them. And she also referred to herself as the mother hen of the group and claimed that Tamla liked her because she kept her faculties about her when she drinks, la la la, just like a lot of random information. So Tamla, like I mentioned, she didn't have a prescription for Xanax and doesn't take it regularly. But Bridget, however, did take Xanax. And she even told investigators that her medication made it impossible for her to lie. And she's so dependent on her anxiety medication that she has to wear a necklace with Xanax in it. She told investigators that she understood it was a controlled substance and she would never share it with anyone. But the GBI subpoenaed the phones and started reading through the text messages and they found evidence that Bridget had shared some type of medication at least twice with her friends at the party prior to that date, and with one friend on the day of Horsford's death. When she was confronted with that information, she did admit that it was true, but she said that she only shared drugs with with her, with the women that she knew well, and she didn't know Tamla well, so she didn't share it with Tamla. Okay. 
Now, on to Jose. He gave some contradictory statements as well. He initially claimed that he rushed right out to check on Tamla, but later on, he describes going out onto the back patio and stumbling upon a cigarette and a lighter on the ground. He claims that because he is OCD, he picked up the cigarette and lighter and put them on the fire pit. Now, keep in mind, he already knew that Tamla was laying face down in the backyard because Madeline had told him, but he claimed in the interview that he would not have stopped to pick up the cigarette and lighter if he had known that Tamla was in the state that she was in. So which is it? Now, Jose was ultimately fired from his job at the courthouse for accessing the incident report from that night internally. An investigation ruled the claim unfounded, but he was still fired, and the court administrator would only say that she had lost confidence in his ability to perform his duties. Tamla's friend, Michelle Graves, had con- has continued to seek justice for her friend and has maintained that her death was not an accident. She said in a quote to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, quote, it's impossible to get the injuries that she had from one fall, end quote. Now, five days after the case was officially closed, Jose, Jean, and several others from the party actually sued Michelle for defamation. They claimed that they had suffered irreparable damages from Michelle's claims about the case. During the defamation case, Michelle was asked to download all of her information from social media, evidence that could be used for the trial, and that information was downloaded to a USB drive. And the USB drive was ultimately stolen from the county courthouse after she had dropped it off there. Now, this was not the first time that this had happened. Michelle said that her personal information was stolen previously and was in the possession of all of the people who were at the party that night. And it turns out that that information was stolen from the case files that Jose had accessed. Now, Jose claims that it wasn't him and anyone could have accessed it, yada, yada, yada. But a Forsyth County Sheriff's deputy was also fired because he was sending information and pictures regarding the case to his girlfriends, and they ratted him out. Good for you, girls. Tamla's friends and family, including her father, do not believe the stories of the witnesses or the claim that this was an accident. After the case was closed, the family couldn't accept the investigators' conclusions, and they ultimately hired an independent pathologist to perform the autopsy. According to Tamla's friend Michelle, the pathologist found multiple scrapes and abrasions all over Tamla's body. There were also injuries that found that were found that reportedly only could have happened after she was dead. Tamla's father also believes that the cut to her wrist happened after she was already dead as well. The case was ultimately reopened in June of 2021 by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation after receiving a letter from Forsyth County claiming they would be ready to assist with the investigation however they could. Ultimately, the GBI has said that they did not find any information to indicate that there was foul play in this case. According to the attorney for the Horsford family, however, Ralph Fernandez said after reviewing the case, they believe that there is a strong possibility of homicide. They also found that multiple witness statements were conflicting and that the scene had not been preserved, which is like, yeah, obviously. (laughs) A petition has gathered more than 700,000 signatures as of 2022, demanding that the FBI handle the reinvestigation to the case. The link will be in the show notes if you want to sign it. As of today, there is no new information, and it doesn't appear that anyone will ever be charged with a crime in this case. If you or anyone knows what really happened to Tamla Horsford that night, please speak up. It's so important that this case is solved. Thank you guys for tuning in to today's episode of The Haunted Corner. The sources for today's episode will be listed in the show notes and also on the blog post for the episode at www.thehauntedcorner.com. Check out the other episodes of The Haunted Corner available now wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. For early access to next week's episode, please visit patreon.com slash thehauntedcorner and join at the $5 per month level. You'll have access to upcoming episodes one week early. Patreon exclusive content, an exclusive The Haunted Corner sticker, and more. Follow us on social media at The Haunted Corner on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok. If you have a case suggestion or correction, please send it to thehauntedcorner at gmail.com or submit it through the website. Until next time, be kind and take care of yourselves, and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye.